So welcome to the lecture um, sponsored by the Hispanic Latino Latina Latin American Center. <laughs> we are very pleased to have you and to have Dr. Gregory Lee Cuellar with us in this opportunity. He serves as the Assistant Professor of Old Testament at Austin Presbyterian Seminary. His wife, Noemi, is with us, I believe. Thank you. Welcome to you. Uh, we also have some visitors, I see, from the south side. So good to have you with us. Dr. Cuellar is um, a border-crossing, interdisciplinary, and intercultural biblical scholar. Before teaching at APS, Austin Presbyterian, he was, among other things, curator of rare books and manuscripts and colonial Mexican imprint collection at Cushing Memorial Library and Archives at Texas A&M University. Alongside numerous journal articles and book chapters, listen to what some of the pieces of the titles of his books are. Passages in the New World, Voices of Marginality, Indexes of Subjectivity and Modern Biblical Criticisms, and Borderlands Hermeneutics. Very interesting, just the titles. We can see, as these titles kind of suggest, his interest in the U.S.-Mexico borderlands, Latino-Latina immigration, race, and empire. Some of his tools are post-colonial theory. You'll have to correct me if it's not so later. But migration studies, museum studies, and collecting studies. In his biblical research, he seeks to expose abusive forms of power in dominant hermeneutical and epistemological regimes. I recently encountered Dr. Cuellar's work in his essay, Contesting State Violence, the Bible, Public Good, and Divinely Sanctioned Violence in the Texas Borderlands, in La Violencia and the Hebrew Bible, a book that came out this year that also has, I believe, an essay by Dr. Cheryl Anderson. Or, are you in there, Ovaldo? No, no, but I'm in there. <laughs> I wrote an afterword to this book, and his essay was very thought-provoking. Uh, it opened my eyes to new dimensions of the history of the borderlands and how white racism has functioned there. For instance, in the history of the Texas Rangers, and I don't mean the team or the TV series, I mean the actual rinches, as they were called, whose physical and symbolic violence make them precursors of the so-called Minutemen and other white militia groups. Suffice it to say that we of the Hispanic Latino Latin American Center are very excited that he accepted our invitation and happy for him to share his research with us today and in, for in informal conversation following this, and also he will preach for us in chapel tomorrow. So please join me in welcome, welcoming Dr. Cuellar. It is a pleasure to be here with you this morning. Thank you for the kind introduction. I'd like to extend a, a thank you to Dr. Uh, Junker for the invitation and her office. Very, very blessed to, to be here today. My wife and I have been well received. Thank you so much for all the hospitality thus far that we've received. By early summer of 2014, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services was operating three temporary shelters for the hundreds of newly arrived unaccompanied Central American children and youth. As reported in a New York Times article on October 21, 2014 entitled Children at the Border, their locations were the naval base Ventura County in California, Fort Sill Army Base in Oklahoma, and the Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas. They had a total bed capacity of about 3,000 beds, uh, though the Defense Department made provisions for HHS to use the three military sites as temporary shelters through January 2015. They were ultimately closed in early 2014. Nearly 7,800 unaccompanied minors were temporarily housed and discharged from these three shelters. On June 5, 2014, the LA Times reported that the shelter at Lackland Air Force Base had reached its full capacity of 1,200 minors, ranging from ages 12 to 17. In May 2014, HHS's Administration for Children and Families had contracted the faith-based nonprofit organization Baptist Child and Family Services, BCFS, to manage 
shelters, um, shelter operations. Using U.S. government records for the 2014 fiscal year, Time magazine re revealed in an article on August 4th, 2014, that the BCFS had received more than $280 million in federal grants to operate both the Lackland Shelter and the Fort Sills Shelter in Oklahoma. In comparison to other contractors granted federal money to house unaccompanied minors in 2014, the BCFS was indeed the largest recipient. Among the primary services BCFS provided were counseling, case management, health screenings, education, and non-obligatory religious instruction. For the Lackland Shelter, BCFS's uh, CEO, Kevin Dinan, solicited volunteer help from local Baptist pastor, Reverend Dan Trevino, to provide the children with religious instruction. Based on a 2014 interview for the San Antonio Express News, Reverend Trevino was conducting five religious services every Sunday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., three for the boys and one for the girls. As he described, the services will, were well attended with about 1,000 to 1,400 children per week. In a Baptist advertisement for Bible donations, Reverend Trevino stated that these children, quote, these children have been placed in a strange place since coming to the United States. They are fearful and non-trusting. Attending a Spanish language worship service is something that is familiar to them, end quote. Through the Texas Baptist disaster recovery, Reverend Trevino was able to collect enough funds to purchase 1,000 Spanish Bibles um, in the Nueva Versión Internacional, all of which were permanently given to the children and youth at the Lackland Shelter. According to uh, Marla Bearden of the Texas Baptist Disaster Recovery, these Bibles were in large part a response to the numerous Bible requests the children and youth had previously made to Reverend Trevino. As he later in indicated to uh, Bearden, they would keep their Bibles on their beds and read them alone and sometimes in groups. Central to Reverend Trevino's biblical instruction was Joshua chapter 1 verse 9, in which, which in the Nueva Versión Internacional reads, Ya te lo he ordenado, sé fuerte y valiente, no tengas miedo, ni te desanimes, porque el Señor tu Dios te acompañará donde quiera que vayas. In his Bible Drive advertisement, Reverend Trevino stated that, quote, this is a power message to these children who have experienced such horrific, fearful situations, end quote. Particularly interesting here was how both a state-contracted faith-based organization, BFCS, uh, and several unaccompanied children and minors themselves at the Lackland Shelter negotiated the contours of religious practice. Clearly, the children's openness to religious instruction, in this case Christianity, pointed to some degree of prior religious experience in their home countries. In their new setting, however, religious practice does not stand alone as a faith-free zone, but rather unfolds within what Nestor Rodriguez and Kristen uh, Paredes call coercive bureau bureaucracy that, form, uh, that from its accumulative effect have a bearing on religious practices. From a meta-narrative vantage point, the concentrated flows of asylum seekers from Central America to the United States have spawned a new era of detention and deportation religiosity. Amid the amorphous complexity of the present U.S. immigration context, religion can be found at the intersection of the coercive arm of the state and the private detention industry. Here, several ethical issues arise as to the precise social contours of the religious services provided in state-contracted private detention facilities, such as making deportation as the only viable mode of liberation detainees have to envision. For the family immigration detention facilities, like those at Dilly and Carnes City, Texas, what versions of the public good is the state promoting 
in its provision of religious services. The Tennessee-based Corrections Corporation of America, CCA, and the Florida-based GEO group are the nation's two largest for-profit prison companies contracted by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Among their federal contracts are the two Texas Family Immigration Detention Facilities in Carnes City and Dilly. Under their purview is the hiring of all facility personnel, including the chaplain. In thinking about the role of chaplains in family detention, it is important, is, it is important to ask the following. What are the political contours of their religious commitments? Do these commitments have a bearing on the form of religious services they provide to detained, unauthorized, single-parent families? Here, there is a potential for state-contracted religious services to incite an unhealthy sense of culpability in detained families by construing their mode of migration as criminal rather than asylum-seeking. For the majority of the Central American Central uh, single parent families held in detention at Dilly and Carnes City, Texas, their daily lives occur within state circumscribed spaces and their movements are regimented and under constant surveillance, all of which convey less a sense of residence than notions of criminality. Even more problematic is not only the condemning role of religious services within family detention, but rather how these services are aligned with ICE's multifaceted enforcement and removal operations. In the summer of uh, 2014, several cities on the Texas border like Brownsville, McAllen, and Laredo encountered a surge of asylum seekers fleeing state, domestic, and criminal forms of violence in Central America. By the end of fiscal year 2014, the U.S. Customs and Border Patrol, CBP, had apprehended over 125,000 unaccompanied children and family units throughout the U.S. Southwest border. For fiscal year 2015, this number dropped to about 60,000 and in 2016 rose again to more than 100,000. The highest numbers of family unit apprehensions for these same fiscal years occurred in the Rio Grande Valley sector which on the Texas-Mexico border ranges from McAllen to Brownsville, Texas. It is also apparent from CBP statistics that the nationalities with the highest representation among the apprehended family units on the southwest border have been Salvadorian, Guatemalan, and Honduran. One explana explanation for the decrease in 2015, especially among Central Americans, was due in large part to the U U.S. government's multi-million dollar international border security initiative with Mexico called Programa Frontera Sur. Here, both countries are uh, determined to increase security training, surveillance technology, and immigration agents near the Guatemalan border and throughout interior Mexico. On the other hand, the sharp increase in 2016 of unaccompanied children and families from Central America may be less an issue of this initiative's effectiveness than the heightened and pervasive levels of despair among those fleeing and the resilience of human smuggling networks. As indicated in a 2014 ICE report entitled Programmatic en Environmental Assessment for actions to address an increased influx of unaccompanied alien children. Quote, ICE enforcement and removal operations is responsible for the docket and management of all arrangements for removal of family units apprehended and processed at the southwest border by CPB and released from CPB custody or transferred to the custody of ICE. Although detention and deportation remain central to the U.S. immigration policy, some Central American families are redirected through a different removal process in which they are released from the CPB holding cell and taken to a nearby bus station. Upon arrival, they redeem a bus voucher 
purchased by an approved sponsor, which is either an extended family member or family friend, and then ordered to report to ICE and appear in immigration court once they arrive to their destination. Among the factors leading to this alternative removal process seems to involve issues of able-bodiedness and available detention bed space. ICE refers to this removal process as EROs, Intensive Supervision a Appearance Program 2, which provides a supervised alternative to detention using case management and technology like the Global Positioning System monitor Monitoring Ankle Bracelet. Nevertheless, both in the volume of press reports and DHS removal statistics, detention and deportation remain paramount to ICE's removal process for Central American families. And I think I have, um, let's see here. In terms of an analogy, the seasonal uh, flows of Central American asylum seekers since 2014 go along a set path, first into detention and then removal deportation. Here, detention functions much like a water dam in that once the migratory flow levels fill the capacity of the detention facilities, CBP and ICE utilize release valves like the Intensive Supervision Appearance Program to sustain state set detention and deportation flows. Arguably, the punitive logic that governs the state's detainment and deportation of Central American asylum seeking families reflects the more aggressive and criminalizing ICE removal procedure of Operation Streamline. In terms of streamlining single parent families, the state has decided to temper its punitive logic with the construction of residential facilities rather than hold them in adult uh, male detention centers. These residences create the appearance of normalcy, uh, which take out of public view the state's punitive agenda while still garnering public approval. Here's some statistics um, on the removals. The quota is about 400,000 um, uh, is the set quota for removals uh, each year. A large number of single pa uh, parent families detained at Carnes uh, County Residential Center in Carnes City and the South Texas Family Residential Center in Dilly are what the state considers, quote, unauthorized asylum seekers. Their unauthorized status combined with the state's meta agenda of deportation is often rendered unseen amidst cultural goods that reflect less the family sense of home than U.S. middle class tastes. And I want to briefly show you a very quick um, ICE produced video. Doesn't have any sound, so don't be nervous. No, it doesn't. Apparently, ICE doesn't want to provide any commentating. 
In contrast to the correctional facilities in which the notion of criminality is on public display, the detention facilities, this one in particular, go to great lengths to subsume their modes of criminalization under cultural objects that would otherwise be unattainable to the detainees in their home country. For example, rather than name these uh, family facilities detention, ICE refers to them as residential. Yet the regimented lives of the detainees bespeaks more an incarcerated condition than that of a neighborhood residence in which families are free to self-regulate and self-sustain in both public and private realms. Indeed, residential uh, implies not the containment of self-expression, but rather fluid, homely spaces that allow for unplanned public and private encounters with self and others. Within the residential facilities at Dili and Karn City, the lives of families are limited to predetermined spaces and circumscribed domains of decision making, all of which socializing them according to U.S. middle class consumer culture. In terms of their cumulative effect, these facilities monopolize multiple life domains of decision making like the weekly food menu, room decor, library book collection, furniture arrangement, room temperature, visiting hours, internet access, just to name a few. Here the surplus of computers, video games, toys, sports equipment, clothing, shoes, and other U.S. cultural goods render unseen the systematized modes of surveillance and censorship that operate at every level of these facilities. The form in which ICE's residential concept takes does not include the cultivation of a sense of home, given that the governing rationale of operations points to the state's meta-agenda of removal deportation. With, uh, with family immigrant detention operations calibrated toward the state's agenda of removal deportation, how does the provision of religious services function within this context? In what ways are the cultural contours of religious practice made to conform to the federal government's removal process? On various fronts of the Central American asylum-seeking experience, religious leaders, case workers, legal personnel, and volunteer translators have attested to the importance of religious faith for both the apprehended unaccompanied children and single parent families. In working with uh, unaccompanied children, one detention caseworker who wished to remain anonymous reported the following, quote, I was amazed to read uh, the Bible with the children and see God's word through the eyes of an immigrant child. One child related to the story of when Jesus' family fled to protect Jesus from being killed. Another related to the story of Joseph, who was sold by his brothers, and many to the story of David facing an impossible situation when he fought Goliath." End quote. In terms of the single parent families, the refugee uh, artwork project Arte de Lagrimas has registered through art making an abiding sense of Christian faith especially in the children and youth. From 2014 to the present, Arte de Lagrimas project members have engaged in multiple art making sessions with groups of single parent accompanied Central American children at the Central Bus Station in McAllen, Texas. Over 80 original drawings have been gifted to the Arte de Lagrimas cause, which primarily consists of raising public awareness through a traveling art exhibit. Similar to the drawing below, uh, many of the Central American uh, children artists present Christian symbols and anthropomorphic images of God, especially in pictures depicting their uh, migratory journeys. This is one example. Uh, the child artist of the above drawing is Diana, a seven-year-old from Guatemala. Here she drew her migratory journey to the U.S. at the McAllen Central bus station. As she described, she and her mother first traveled many days by car, and there it is on the top, um, and then by bus. She remembered that the road was long and gray. Uh, 
Her picture narrative ends with them crossing the Rio Grande on, the, on a makeshift raft, lancha. She first started drawing the rocks, las piedritas, on the riverbed, followed by a makeshift raft in the middle of the river with her and her mother inside. The volunteer uh, project member asked Diana, quote, when you left Mexico, did anyone say goodbye to you? End quote. She replied, my aunt. She then drew her aunt on the Mexican side of the river, waving goodbye. Again, the volunteer asked, quote, was there anyone else with you? She remained silent and then removed the rosary from around her neck and placed it on her drawing. With the crucifix over the Rio Grande, she proceeded to trace it and said that while she and her mother were on the raft, they were singing the Spanish hymn, In la Cruz, in la Cruz yo primero vi la luz, a las manchas de mi alma yo la ve, fui allí por fe, yo vi a Jesús y siempre feliz con él seré. Diana's drawing is one of several narrative pictures in the Arte de Lágrimas Refugee artwork exhibit that express a deep form of religious belief, in particular Christianity. A similar phenomenon can be observed in the 20th century retablos ex votos sampled in the Mexican Migration Project at Princeton University and in the book Miracles on the Border by uh, Jorge Durand and Douglas Massey. Prominent within these votive narrative paintings are images of miracles mediating through sacralized images of Jesus, the Virgin Mary, and cherished saints. As uh, Duran and Massey describe, these, quote, holy images provide a cultural anchor for people adrift in a sea of strange experiences, exotic tongues, and odd customs, end quote. For the Mexican immigrant experience, the belief in the miraculous is rooted in, a localized, ex uh, in localized expressions of Roman Catholicism in which certain holy images function as channels for prayer and are understood to be mediators of the divine to humanity. In both the Central American ch children art and the Mexican immigrant votive paintings, religious belief portrays the divine contravening state boundaries in order to ensure the safe passage of either the asylum-seeking family or the adult undocumented immigrant. These and other frontline testimonies about the religious faith of Central American asylum seekers are corroborated by the Pew Research Center's Forum on Religion and Public Life. According to its 2014 report on religious affiliations, uh, beliefs, and practices, Latin America is uh, home to more than 425 million Catholics, nearly 40% of the world's total Catholic population. To a certain extent, these religious ties um, have been strengthened by Pope Francis and his uh, Latin American cultural identity. According to the Center for the Study of Global Christianity at Gordon-Conwell, the, uh, theological Seminary, Central America has, uh, was 97.6% Christian in 1970 and is projected to remain 95.6% Christian in 2020. Although Roman Catholicism represents the majority in Central America, independent Christians and various offshoots of Protestantism have been on the rise since the early 20th century. Independent Christians represented 2.1% uh, of the region's population in 1970 and 4.3% in 2010. They are projected to reach 4.8% of the population by 2020. Moreover, Protestant churches have experienced even more dramatic growth than independence, increasing steadily from 2.1% of the population in 1970 to a projected 7.3% in 2020. According to the Pew Research Center El Salvador, at Honduras and Guatemala show the highest levels of religious commitment among, other, among their Christian populations. Here, daily prayer and weekly uh, attendance to religious services are an integral part of their lives and sense of well-being. 
Clearly, the above data, data alongside frontline testimony indicate high levels of religiosity among Central Americans. The ways in which their religious belief carries over into their asylum-seeking experience has in view issues of survival from both state, criminal, and uh, in-group forms of violence. Given the risks involved in traversing gang-controlled territories and anti-immigrant state regimes, especially for mother-child families, the appeal to religious beliefs is not simply ritual devotion, but rather provoked by supra-traumatic situations. In this sense, surviving the traumas of the migratory journey expands their religious hermeneutical vision, which they in turn carry with them into mandatory detention and removal. With the migratory experience comes um, new contours to their religious beliefs, of which involve a theology of escape uh, and liberation from sa uh, state-sanctioned detention. Hence, how, how do Central American single-parent detainees at Carnes uh, County Residential Center and the South Texas Family Residential Center live out the liberating vision offered anew by their reshaped religious beliefs in a state-controlled context that has no escape policy other than deportation. On the other hand, what sort of constraints are facility administrators, detention chaplains, and volunteer clergy imposing on their liberating hopes, especially given that the state's primary agenda is detention and deportation? On the surface, the provision of religious services in family immigrant detention facilities fulfills Section 3 of the 2000 Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, which in general states, no government shall impose or a substantial burden on the religious exercise of a person residing in or confined to an institution as defined in Section 1997 of, the, of this title even if the burden results from a rule of general applicability unless the government demonstrates the imposition of the burden on that person." End quote. According to the 1997 Civil Rights of Institutionalized Persons Act, the term institution extends to any facility owned, operated, or managed by, or provides services on behalf of any state or political subdivision of a state. Among the facilities that meet this criteria Criteria are pretrial detention facilities, which include family immigrant residential facilities. In these later facilities, however, the removal process of single parents and their children remain an integral part of what the state considers compelling governmental interests. In both the Carnes City Residential Center and the South Texas Family Residential Center, parent-child detainees have access to a chapel, a hired detention chaplain, and approved volunteer uh, clergy. And I think I had that. There it is. And there you can see the early blueprints of the uh, South Texas uh, Residential Center in Dilly, um, where the chapel sits, right in the center where the red box is. According to the 2011 Performance Based National Detention Standards, Detainees of different religious beliefs are provided reasonable and equitable opportunities to participate in the practices of their respective faiths, constrained only by concerns about safety, security, and the orderly operation of the facility. For the detained children whose only offense is unauthorized entry, their religious formation will inevitably be constrained by governmental interests. Thus, religious instruction that promotes their freedom from detention is subject to state censorship. For both Carn City and Dilly family detention facilities, it is the private detention company, GEO or CCA, that oversees the recruitment and employment of detention chaplains. As stipulated in the 2011 PB NDS, this is the sta these standards that govern um, detention facilities, quote, a chaplain sh shall have a minimum qualification of clinical pastoral education or specialized training and endorsement by the appropriate religious certifying body, end quote. 
in general, CCA requires their chaplains to have a bachelor's degree in divinity, theology, or religion from accredited college and a master's degree in divinity, theology, and biblical studies from a seminary, the, a school of theology or university um, uh, divinity school. In addition to theological education, the chaplain is required to have a denominational endorsement, three years full-time pastoral experience, and at least one unit of clinical pastoral education. As for the GEO group chaplains, um, they are primarily required to have a certification from American uh, Cor Correctional Chaplains Association, clinical pastoral education, and an ecclesiastical endorsement. They also must be an ordained and licensed clergy within their respective denominations. Apart from meeting U.S.-based chaplaincy standards and theological education, detention chaplains must comply with the facility's rules and procedures, which are ICE certified. For instance, a detention chaplain is, quote, prohibited from providing any legal advice or counsel to residents in care and is expressly prohibited from hindering or interfering with a resident's custody arrangements or in the execution of final removal orders, end quote. Although detention chaplains are able to provide pastoral care and counseling to detainees who request it, they are considered unfit for duty if their performance has involved, quote, acquiescence, negligence, misconduct, lack of diligence, good judgment, and slash or common sense resulting in or contributing to a resident escape, end quote. Here, the faci facility's orderly operation has a bearing on the contours of religious services that the detention chaplain provides to detainees. Religious services rooted in a state ideology of detainment and deportation stand in stark contrast to the liberationist impulses present within the religious beliefs of detained Central American single parent families. Through the religious services of detention chaplains, detained single parent families are nurtured along a state approved trajectory which does not include a humane liberation. In other words, religious practice and theological instruction conform to the state's agenda of detention and deportation. As stated in the 2011 standards, quote, detainees shall have regular opportunities to participate in practices of their religious faiths limited only by a documented threat to safety of persons involved in such activity itself or disruption of order in the facility, end quote. Ultimately, the religious practices of detainees must conform to the state's immigration enforcement, which regulate the actualization of a liberationist vision, such as the Holy Week fast that over 80 detained mothers initiated at the Carnes County Residential Center. According to press reports, their religious fast was less about individual Christian piety than a collective religious practice of protest for liberation. Accompanying their Holy Week fast was a signed letter demanding the release of themselves and their children. Indeed, liberation was a salient theme throughout their letter. The following is an excerpt from their letter that I have translated. During this hunger strike, not one mother will work in the det detention center. Neither will we send our children to school, nor will we utilize any other service in this place until they, demands, are heard and approved. We want in capital letters, libertar, liberty. You should know that this is only the beginning. We will not stop until fulfilling our objective. This hunger strike will continue until each of us are placed in liberty." End quote. After ending their five-day Holy Week fast on Good Friday, they then gave authorities 10 days to address their concerns. In this instance, religious practice grounded in hopes of humane liberation 
disrupted the facility's orderly operation of detention and deportation. Many of the mothers leading the fast were placed in isolation or kept from seeing their children. With a constraint on theologies of humane liberation, detained families are forced to accept deportation as, relig as religious practice of liberation, or what I call deportation as a sacrament of the state. At issue here are the ways in which state-sanctioned modes of control circumscribe religious beliefs to the extent that deportation is made to serve as the only viable religious interpretation of detention liberation for the detainees. In surveying the various reports on deported mothers and children, it is clear that deportation is not the sort of liberation that one would imagine as viable and humane religious practice. Consider the following statement in a 2016 report by the American Immigration Council. Quote, this report features first-hand accounts from eight women recently deported to Central America after being held with their children at one of the family detention centers in Dilly or Corn, Corn City, Texas, or Berks County, Pennsylvania. The testimonies reveal that for the most part, upon return, these women live in hiding, are terrified to live, leave their homes, are confronted with extreme hardship, receive frequent threats, and have no access to any protections or assistance from state institutions. In the end, deportation runs counter to the liberating hopes that inspired many of these women to flee the violence in their home countries. Even more troubling is that these same hopes of liberation intersect with their religious beliefs, which in turn sustain them through the traumas of their migratory journey to the United States. By accepting the state's sacrament of deportation, asylum-seeking families are forced to foreclose on an, on an important feature of their religious beliefs, which is captured in the words of the 80-plus detained mothers who engage in a Holy Week fast at the Carnes Detention Center, quote, queremos nuestra libertad, end quote. Conclusion. Across the spectrum of prohibited and non-prohibited religious practices in family detention, the natural impulse of the state is constraint, censorship, and inspection. These modes of operation permeate every segment of the detention facility, in particular religious services. The subjectivity of religious belief makes it difficult to register how notions of order, safety, and security converge in nefarious ways to sacralize the state's removal process. Through daily micro-constraints, all in the name of orderly operations, the religious practices of detainees slowly acquiesce to the detention center's core value system. Here, hired chaplains and volunteer clergy are instrumental in marking the boundaries of appropriate religious practice. For developing children, the accumulative effect of religious boundary control by the detention chaplain is an indoctrination process whereby detained children inherit state-sanctioned religious concepts rather than their parents' cultural religious traditions. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a few minutes for questions, comments, and Dr. Cuellar will field his own questions and I'll take the mic around. Wait till the mic gets to you to ask the question. Thank you. Um, you know, as you were giving this presentation, I was thinking how much the, um, the residence centers and detention centers and the children especially reminded me of um, the practice of boarding schools. Um, do you find any s similarity in terms of the way that the children were sort of Christianized? Mm. Because it is a form of, um, in the case of boarding schools, it was forced removal of children and separated them from the parents, you know, and then the Christianization, civilization process, quote unquote, takes place. In the case of the detention centers where the children are along, particularly the religious um, you know, instruction couched in the form of um, benevolence, if you will, 
and, and especially you know the, the presence of adults. Um, do you, do you think there are some similarities there? That, I mean, shared practice or. I appreciate the question. I haven't made a direct link to to that experience of boarding school, but it's I think there's an interesting possibility there. Um, I mean, in terms of the internment camps um, during World War II, right, of the, of the Japanese children, um, there's certainly a lot of uh, similarities and points of intersection there where many of the children would, um, or the adults accompanying the children would create rock gardens as a religious expression and, and how that was sort, sort of functioning underneath the radar of general, what was uh, appropriate general religious practice. But in terms of the disciplining that's happening in boarding schools, I haven't looked at that particular connection. And that may be a, something I, I certainly would want to consider. Because I, I, I would have a hunch that there would be uh, a lot that could be gleaned from that. Thank you. Thank you for what you presented to us. It seems to me that um, the policy that that the, the government is operating on um, denies the aspect of asylum to these folks who are indeed fleeing for asylum. That rather than, than think of them in that way, because then they'd have to accept them, then they think of them as criminals that are um, breaking the law coming to the United States. Um, I kind of know why they're thinking that, but tell me where you stand with that. How, that why the policy for dealing with persons who come from South America is treated as one of criminalization versus asylum, which they're entitled to? Well, I think one of the things that you, you could see um, where this is showing a, a, a sort of a, a contrast in, in approach by the Homeland Security is with the Syrian refugees and uh, Central American um, asylum seekers is how the state reacts in, in different ways and, and, and uh, the kinds of spaces and, and networks that are, are summoned to help um, address that particular issue, right, that context, the Syrian refugee context, over against the Central American context, which seems to reflect um, an abiding response by the uh, U.S. federal government um, uh, against Latin American immigrants. Uh, there's, uh, uh, I think, important part of it has to do with uh, a raciology. There's a racial logic that certainly permeates the judicial system and the political system where brown bodies are racialized and criminalized. Um, and so, and that's one component that perhaps I didn't, I didn't flesh out fully in, in, in my talk, but it's certainly uh, governing also the, how, you know, how the state legitimizes what it does to Central Americans, Mexicans, um, those from the Caribbean, um, and, and, and Southern uh, South America. So there's a racial logic that I, it's an abiding racial logic that exists within U.S. judicial system and immigration system. I'd like to have you help me uh, flesh out a little bit more understanding the um, how the chaplains are actually functioning there uh, in order to um, it sounds like maintain the state uh, agenda um, and that's one level um, to the religious services through their pastoral care they're providing or are they highly um, trained or oriented to only function certain ways uh, and say certain things uh, or lose your job. Uh, and then second, uh, I would clarify the kind of chaplaincy. You mentioned those who are trained who have the bachelor's, master's, and CPE, at least one unit. Uh, and then you mentioned another kind because um, uh, that maybe was not the same amount of education or yeah. and which is actually being hired at the facility you're talking most about? Okay. Well, uh, to your last question, the private detention company governs operations. So for the Dilly uh, Center, it's the CCA, 
private detention company. They, they oversee the administration and hiring of, of detention or facility personnel. Uh, they, they interpret, uh, so they have liberty to interpret the standards in ways that will cut costs primarily, right? So that, that's, that's um, and then the uh, Carn City is uh, superintend, superintended by the uh, GEO group, and they have decided to and be a little less stringent on the sort of qualifications, credentialing that the chaplain uh, needs to have in order to be hired uh, at the detention facility. So both, you know, depending on which company oversees the facility, uh, will depend on the, the kind of hiring practice that is uh, instituted um, but ultimately, you know, however it's interpreted, the detention for chaplains for both facilities are required to go through um, a particular kind of training. So there, there's, there's so many hours of training that they uh, have to undergo before they even sign on as a detention chaplain. They have to also um, agree to particular kinds of rules and procedures um, disclosure issues, uh, information, um, you know, the censoring of certain kinds of information. Uh, all of that is part of the, the process that is not perhaps reflective in other chaplaincy um, hiring processes. So it's what, that's what makes it unique, that, that interim between fulfilling the, the credentials for chaplaincy in general, but then you have the ICE uh, requirements and how one is to operate within the facilities, what one can say, what one cannot say, how one can interact with detainees uh, soliciting for uh, counseling and, and not soliciting, uh, where, where one is able to maneuver theologically, right, where, where you can press in terms of teaching. The, um, Holy Week fast? Yeah, Baptist, uh, Baptist yes. Are they the ones no, um, no, they're not. They, they, they were the initial uh, faith-based um, nonprofit organization that was hired, contracted by the federal government to oversee the, sh the, the, the three shelters that were set up for the unaccompanied children. But in terms of single parent family detention facilities, that has morphed into a whole different economy where the private industry, private prison industry, or private prison companies have converged onto that economy and now have become, are participating um, as, as, as um, investors within that economy and then they have their certain ways of operating. So they kind of operate, if you're familiar with city-states, right, in the kind of the Old Testament context, they they're sort of function like city-states, right? So they, they have, once you enter into the, that city-state, immigration law, uh, civil rights, religious freedoms, they're, all, they're, they're dynamic. Looks like we have the time for maybe one or two short questions. Hi. Um, so my question is about language. Um, in the beginning, you mentioned that the Bibles that were given out um, were in Spanish. So I've had some experience working with unaccompanied minors at a center here in Chicago. Um, and just from that, I'll good chunk for them, um, Spanish was their second or maybe even third language, mm -hmm. and most actually spoke um, some kind of indigenous or native dialect as mm -hmm. their first. So I'm just wondering how that was handled. Yeah, yeah so, uh, um, and that goes back to the question back there in terms of the racial logic. Right? We, we, when we understand Latin American experience, it's always uh, within a sort of a myopic, myopic uh, view uh, of you know, Spanish-speaking population. So it just a lot of these volunteers, and even e up until today, I mean, you still don't have adequate translators to be able to uh, represent uh, the, the multiple Mayan dialects that many of the children speak. So they go um, unrepresented in many of the courts, and which leads ultimately to, to their deportation. Uh, and uh, that's unfortunate, but yeah, it is, it is something that was, that it was present during that early surge, as humanitarian efforts were summoned and the state was also brought to address the issue, never was it thought of to uh, supply uh, trilingual and, you know, these, these trilingual translators to be able to deal with the, the indigenous dialects. 
So it looks like we're kind of running out of time. Maybe one last question. Could I have uh, Dr. Tires here? Sure. Uh, it's his birthday, so I want. Was it really? <laughs> I want to make sure he he gets a chance to. You must have seen it on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Cuellar, thank you for a wonderful lecture. I love, first of all, I love all the different levels that you addressed the, the question on, them, both in terms of the state ideology, as well as in the words of the mothers themselves, as well as in the drawings of the children. So I thought that was really, really well done. Um, my question is just a follow-up on the pastoral aspect mm -hmm. of, of what you're seeing here. Um, and I'm wondering if you have seen other models or are aware of other models in which faith-based um, groups have gone into detention centers such as the one that you're describing and really kind of challenge the state ideology theology that you're describing. So I have in mind, for example, a, a local group in Chicago called the Interfaith Committee for Detained Immigrants, which is a third party that goes into detained uh, detention centers um, and is not paid by the state but simply is present at, at key junctures in the detention process to be in solidarity with those who are in detention centers or those who are about to be deported from detention centers. So I'm wondering if you could comment on this notion of solidarity. I mean, I think the real question that you're raising is, you know, how can we counter a state theology that is so punitive uh, that is so masked by censorship and, and control on so many different levels, how can there surface a liberationist method uh, or orientation? And I'm wondering if solidarity, if this idea of solidarity may be one inroad into that, because it's, it's a fine dance that these groups have to, have to do when they're in detention centers. I mean, you can't be so radical that you get kicked out but at the same time, you need to show that there's a certain presence, that the God is with you, that people are aware of your situation. So I'm just wondering if you could comment on that. Are there examples of solidarity that you saw or, or maybe other examples that you know of around the country? Mm -hmm. Thank yes, you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate the question. And I'll give you an example. When the Dili Detention Center was being built, ICE was um, allowing for or ICE was actually in charge of um, hiring or um, uh, recruiting volunteer clergy from the local community. So there was a, there was a particular religious group of, of nuns who were um, recruited to go into detention, that detention facility and provide religious services. And, and that functioned for a certain time until the, the, the detention facility cut, severed ties, just out of nowhere, severed ties with that group and not, didn't give any explanation why. So one day they go to the detention facility and they weren't, they weren't allowed and they were, set and they, and they were given the, the excuse that the uh, private prison or the private detention company now will oversee the hiring of religious personnel. And I don't know if that has something, well, in speaking to some of the nuns who were part of this, they, they were enraged, of course, and, 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 and a lot of the correspondences that I've had with them, um, I've, I've been able to see that they did have a, a different posture of, of how to uh, stand alongside um, and, and, and be one of, of a presence of hope, not one who's going to perpetuate the, the state system. Um, so just sort of connecting the dots. It, most likely what led to their departure had to do with the very fact that they were pushing on those edges that the state was, was so uh, determined to control. And so they, they, they severed it. So I, I haven't seen anything else uh, ha transpire uh, since then. Um, I'd be interested to, to hear about what, what's happening here in this part of, of, of the US. Uh, I think that there's an enormous amount probably a different level of control that's happening with the family detention centers, right? Where that, the, the, the constraints on religious uh, belief and practice um, play out differently, much more constrained. Okay, so obviously there's a lot more we'd like to talk about, more questions, more dialogue, and that will be possible if you, br oh, 
okay, come. If you bring your lunch, the so-called brown bag lunch at Loader, Loader Presidential, what's it called? BBR, yeah, yeah uh, that, that room, we can continue the conversation. Yeah. Gratitude. Thank you. For your presentation. Gracias.